Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for creating time today to learn a little bit about prioritization of specific communities. Uh, really excited to dive into this topic and hopefully provide you with some tips um, along the way. Uh, my name is Justin Van Zerber. I'm the director of programs with supplybank.org. Uh, we are contracted through ACF to provide training and technical assistance uh, to the DDDRP uh, grantees and subgrantees. Um, this recording is uh, will be recorded and transcribed. Uh, we're able to share it on the website in about two weeks. Um, I because no one is on this call, we'll not be dropping questions in the chat, um, but want to reiterate that we are available for uh, another presentation or diving into a specific aspect of this program if additional guidance is needed. The objective today is to discuss different approaches to deciding on which populations to prioritize and how those decisions impact your programmatic outcomes. Each of these different topics will have considerations uh, and each program is unique. So taking that into account when listening to this presentation, knowing that some of the information will align and some might not be needed. Again, want to reiterate if additional guidance or training is needed, SBO staff is available and you can reach out to Christian Browning. Her email is Christian, K-R-I-S-T-I-A-N at supplybank. Dot org. First, we will talk about the different types of priority populations. Each grantee and their subgrantees will have their own approach to which populations to prioritize for this project. And this presentation should help you consider other efforts that might be a good fit for your organization. With limited resources available, it is important to explore different approaches to serving subsets of the population so your project can penetrate deep into a community. Programs may have age requirements and with diapering programming, this can be used to target specific developmental goals of a child. For instance, your program can be used as a way to get new caregivers connected to the safety net for the first time by targeting zero to six months year olds or even engaging with caregivers pre-birth to ensure they are set up safely to bring their child home from the hospital. This approach sets the new caregiver up for success and reinforces the importance of diapering from the onset. Another strong approach is to target three-year-olds as the larger diapers cost more and the sooner caregivers do not have to pay for the diapers, the better. This type of approach can be interwoven into potty training classes, preparing them for the start of school. There are many different sub age groups that add a benefit. So examine the outcomes of other programs and assess ways to leverage this resource to support those goals. Different areas of the county or state may receive access to different types of services. This is an opportunity to prioritize areas that may be underrepresented or and highlight the work in that area. You can also tailor the program to focus on residents of a specific area that may have other barriers due to their location. Your type of intervention may be a better fit for certain areas of your community. For example, home visitation is a great approach for rural areas, while larger distribution events are effective in more urban areas. Poverty level is a simple way to create parameters of the populations you want to serve. This allows you to focus on some of the most impacted communities and ensure they have access to this valuable resource. This can be difficult as it requires the participants to provide supporting documents and may create barriers to participation in some communities. If your organization is using poverty levels, it is helpful to be cognizant of which individuals may not be able to meet the requirements and if possible, make accommodations or other eligibility requirements. One approach specifically to this pilot, it may be targeting wraparound services as an indicator. This could help facilitate participation and involvement in your other programs that may be struggling to meet their deliverables. If there is a program struggling, 
layering a resource such as diapers can be a large incentive to boost engagement. Your pilot may want to look into serving specific demographics of people to see if there's a difference in service level and the participation by the differentiation. Using one of these priorities may lead to certain races or other identifying demographics being served more frequently than their peers. Work to evaluate your participation with an equity lens. There are many data sources available to help you take a more analytical, pro analytical approach to selecting which types of populations to serve and where those people are. The first noted here is federal census data. This is available all the way down to census track, but can also be used at zip code, city, and county level. Working as part of the Cal Kappa network, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this resource. They provide several trainings on their website that assist with navigating the various tools available to the public. I highly recommend spending some time here to broaden your understanding of this resource. Census data can help determine higher areas of poverty, either to ensure there is programming in close proximity to those locations, or to help understand a community to set an appropriate level for eligibility. This means some areas may need to increase or decrease the amount of poverty level the individual is experiencing in order to be eligible for this specific program. States, counties, cities also have valuable data that helps look at our community through another lens. Lens. I shared an example of one of the tools we use in California. This is the, called the Healthy Places Index, and it highlights a community's level of stress across many indicators and connects it back to the likelihood of healthy outcomes in the community. When we are looking for new partners, we use this tool as a guide to find them in those areas. At the onset of COVID, we use tools produced by the state to prioritize distributions of resources in high prevalence areas. Depending on what data is available, you can be creative with ways to gauge who you want to serve and what. Another approach we have taken is to look at the concentration of nonprofits or resources in specific areas. As stated above, you want to take an equitable approach to serving the community, and this may mean investing in areas that have not traditionally been invested in. We have seen success when launching a program into traditionally underserved areas as it highlights the disparity of local stakeholders, as well as encourages others to join the supporting community. Good morning, Cheryl. There are many benefits that come from prioritizing populations with this type of programming. You can align this programming with organizational goals or larger community goals. All of your agencies are working to address poverty and the symptoms related to poverty. This work amplifies one of the many impacts poverty has on individuals and communities, allowing you to highlight the specific community and why this type of intervention is so important. This is a great way to expand on localized efforts and build a reputation for collaboration. This continues to reinforce the value you bring to the community and the lasting impacts your work has. Having a target approach makes it easier to decide who is eligible and who is not. There are never enough resources, so by targeting specific groups, it helps make the decision for who you are to serve. This helps frontline staff in making decisions and feeling confident knowing that the criteria they have to be, that there is criteria that participants have to meet. While this may prevent some caregivers from participating, it may be helpful to create a buffer to allow some participation for individuals who do not do not fully meet the criteria. This type of adaptation allows for frontline staff to be able to advocate for certain families who are extenuating circumstances. The best benefit is in the ability 
in my mind, is the ability to test different approaches to see which makes the largest impact. This may be, this might be able to be seen in a short period of time, but will definitely be seen as you sustain your program and make adaptations to this, to the, to serve the community better. Take time with your team to fully understand which communities you want to prioritize and how that relates to the long in long term impact you want to see. Excuse me. There will be many opinions on which populations you should focus on. This is difficult to navigate, but with the approaches shared above, you should feel confident in your decision making. Even when decisions are made, there may be other stakeholders that express desire to alter the approach. Having justification for your decisions will assist in navigating those conversations. While you should feel comfortable in your decision, it can be beneficial to, to be open to explore changes if they have the potential to deepen your impact. We are aware that our programs are not able to serve everyone, and sometimes you will not even be able to serve all of the participants within a certain group. It is important to set expectations from the beginning and work to address any gaps in service. We find it helpful to get specific with the populations we are prioritizing, so the number of people not being served who meet the criteria is smaller. It feels different as an agent to, as an agency to say we only served 100 out of the 1500 people who are eligible versus we're able to serve 100 of the 135 people who meet all of our criteria. This does not eliminate the need for the larger population but it can show external stakeholders the power of this intervention and hopefully lead to additional investments to expand the eligibility requirements. Stakeholder input is super valuable and can help enhance our programs. It's important to gather if you are gonna use it. Share back your findings and maybe some of your alterations you made based on the feedback you received. Again, equity should be at the front of your decision making using data and use data and be creative with your approaches. In the next few slides, we will discuss accommodations in your programs that assist with alignment to the specific communities you want to serve. There are many forms of outreach that have been successfully used and continue to be successful from mailers, phone calls, et cetera. Different generations will interact with your outreach very differently, and the type of outreach should match the population you are trying to interact with. For younger generations, we've, we've found success with the use of social media or text messaging, as it might be more effective than a phone call. Creating a tailored approach will take significantly more time during the initial phase of setup but the engagement numbers should reflect this increased effort. If people are not engaging, it might be helpful to try a different approach. Document these types of approaches used to make sure you can reflect and enhance future communications. Since this program has a limited amount of funding and your program is only able to serve a certain number of people, it is important to consider how frequently communications will be shared. You may fill your program and create a waitlist through the first attempt of engagement, while other areas or communities who are not traditionally connected to the safety net may take several interactions to participate. One thing to be cognizant here is when identifying that specific population, the type of communication needs to be respectful of their culture. Sometimes multiple phone calls or a phone call, email, and text message is all appropriate. While other times cultures may feel, certain cultures may feel bombarded by that type of engagement and not want to participate. Asking questions, learning, and documenting will help you enhance your outreach to those specific populations. 
Similar to outreach, ongoing engagement needs to be designed to fit the population you are serving. Once a participant has begun to engage with your program, it is vital to ensure their ongoing needs are met. Each participant will be unique with individual needs. While you may not be able to address every need, you can identify themes that are common across the populations being served. Follow-up communications should match the populations being served. One common concern with people living in, in poverty is keeping a consistent phone number as they may need to switch due to a variety of circumstances. Having alternative ways to connect and communicate with them allows you to stay in touch even as other barriers may arrive. Tailored communications will make populations feel more comfortable and increase the likelihood of participation. Including questions about follow up in the initial intake server can help address some of the ideas, uh, some of these ideas on the onset. Many time programs, many times programs can combine or create additional opportunities for participants to remain connected to your program. If someone is attending activity on a monthly basis, they may not make it a priority the following month, making engagement much more difficult. If your strategies include other events or meetings, participants may stay more connected. It is vital to build a community and promote trust. This is done from your agency to the partner and is also done by having participants interact with their peers. It is helpful to have people who look and act like them so there is an increased level of comfort. Surveys can be a great source of information, but will need to be accessible to all of your participants so they feel included. This may mean translating your survey or evaluation into multiple languages. It also could mean providing the survey in multiple forms, for example, paper, online, through a tablet, etc. So people with different skill sets with technology can still provide you with quality data. Lastly, certain target pop targeted populations may have other barriers such as vision, hearing, ability to write. So having staff available to accommodate helps strengthen relationships and ultimately produces more quality outcomes. As the participants transition through the program, additional needs may rise and your, your team will understand the longer term trajectory of the family and caregiver. Designing an approach that continues to serve their needs and connects them to resources beyond this program will strengthen your outcomes for this project. You want to ensure them that there are resources available even after the conclusion of this pilot. Over the life of this program, your team has spent almost two years or more building a relationship with this person or family, and there may be future resources that they become eligible for. Creating ways to stay connected will make future programming easier while reinforcing your status in the community. Even if the specific family may not be the perfect fit for the future program, it may lead to another connection in their community. And in summary, there are many different approaches to serving your community, and it really is about understanding how and where you want to prioritize these resources. Having conversations both internally with your staff and team and externally with stakeholders to fully understand where this best fits the ongoing need. Use data to inform your decisions. I've shared a couple of resources and I'm sure you're familiar with many more that are more tailored to your community. Data not only reinforces that the work and choices you are making are accurate, but it helps you paint a picture and tell a story. Sometimes over long periods of time, that data may shift and that may be due to the interventions that you are providing. Documenting that and sharing that reinforces the work that you're doing. And lastly, test, analyze and revamp. We are all piloting programs and learning as we go. 
take the skills that are being shared and take your previous experiences to take to make your first effort. But then document and understand where your choices have been successful and where there's opportunities for improvement. Revisit that information and try to incorporate as much as possible. Since there's no one on this call, I'm going to close the presentation early, but I do want to re-invite everyone to connect to supplybank.org and reach out if you'd like to discuss any of this information further. Thank you for your time today, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.